everybody. We are delighted to have Sister Brenda Dolphin with us today. Sister Brenda Dolphin is a Sister of Mercy. She's widespread international experience as an educator. She worked as a secondary and vocational school teacher, teaching languages and maths. She's also worked as formation director and she spent 20 years working in the Gregorian University in Rome, lecturing in the area of psychology. Since 2006, she has been the postulator for the cause of the founder of the Congregation of Mercy, Sister Catherine McCauley. Sister Brenda Dolphin is the postulator or promoter for the cause of the Venerable Catherine, who founded the Sisters of Mercy in 1831. And I'm very fortunate to be working in and speaking from Mary Immaculate College in Limerick, which is founded by the Mercy Sisters, the Mercy Order. And I know many people watching today are coming from Mercy, Mercy Ethos Colleges. Catherine Macaulay was declared venerable by Pope John Paul II in 1990. And since, since 2019, Sister Brenda has also served in leadership in the South Central Province of the Congregation. It's a real honour and pleasure and joy to have you join us at the Irish Institute for Catholic Studies today. OK, Patricia. That's OK. okay. So thank you very much, Patricia. And uh, thank you to everybody who's here. And again, it's a real privilege for me to have this chance to talk to you about Catherine McCauley, uh, whom I describe as a woman for her own time and for ours. Um, and I'm just going to focus maybe on, you know, something of the life of Catherine. And then I'd like to look at Catherine as an educator. I thought that might be useful, given that we are uh, coming from a college of education. Um, and let me start. I'm sure you know something of the life of Catherine, but um, just one or two aspects maybe that would be helpful for us. Um, family. Family was the core and centre of Catherine Macaulay's life. Uh, she was a woman who, like, certainly saw family as very important. Her father, James Magali, he was born around 1723 and he died in 1783. He was a Dubliner by birth and he was about 30 years older than her mother when they got married in 1777. The couple had three children, two girls, Catherine, who was born in 1778, Mary, who was born in 1781, and then they had a boy, James, who was born in 1783. Why Catherine's father was alive, the family was quite comfortably off, which was unusual for a Catholic family in Ireland at the time because of the penal laws. But James Magali was an astute businessman, and we know that Catherine must have got something like that from him as well, because she was also astute herself in her business dealings. He was an astute businessman who was also known to be an excellent carver, a wood carver, an excellent carpenter. He was a merchant, a timber merchant with property holdings. He identified himself as a grazier when he leased land in the Stormonstown area of Dublin in 77. 1770, sorry. He had houses in the inner city of Dublin on Fishamble Street and a business in Copper Alley off Lord Edward Street, which was directly in the direct shadow of Dublin Castle, which was the seat of the power of the English at the time. And when Catherine was a child, a baby up to five years old, the family lived at Stormonston in North County Dublin. Catherine was only five years old when her father died. And as the years passed, her childhood memories of her father, though faint, are said to have clustered around his kindness to the poor children in the Stormonston and Fishamble neighbourhoods. And while her memories may have been vague, her father's influence seems to have penetrated deep into the recesses of her heart. She, all through her life, held on to her Catholic faith 
even though her mother and other members of her family over time converted to Protestantism. Catherine also grew up to be a woman who had a deep and abiding respect and love for those who were less fortunate than she was. And this provided a wellspring of inspiration that carried her through many of the ups and downs of her life. In 1784, a year after her husband's death, Eleanor Conway Macaulay, now a young widow with three small children to rear on her own, moved the family from Stormonston to a house in Glasnevin on the north side of Dublin. And three years later, the family moved again to 52 Queen Street, where they shared a house with a Mrs. St. George, who was a Protestant a very close friend of Eleanor Macaulay and also a woman who had great influence on Eleanor. For the 15 years between her father's death and her mother's death, Catherine lived with her mother, brother and sister in the inner city of Dublin. As the years went by, their financial situation deteriorated. Eleanor was unable to manage the financial, the family finances and the business interests left to her by her husband. Mother and daughter, Catherine and Eleanor, differed as regards the practice of religion, but Catherine held on to her Catholic faith. And from Eleanor's point of view, we see that her mother did not force her to change her religion either. Two years before Eleanor's death in October 1798, when Catherine was 20 years of age, the family was in very difficult financial circumstances and had to break up. Mary and James, these are Catherine's siblings, they moved in with the Armstrong family. Now, the Armstrongs were Protestant relatives of their mother, while Catherine stayed with her mother. And in staying with her mother, they moved in with her mother's brother, Owen Conway, an army surgeon and his family on East Arran Street. Catherine nursed her mother through her long illness. And Eleanor seemingly had a very difficult death. Death until she came to her own deathbed by which time she had reached an extraordinarily calm acceptance, which was a long way from the terror that gripped her in the face of death as a young 20 year old. We can just imagine how Catherine must have felt as she buried her mother. She was not only devastated by her loss, but now she, her sister and brother were orphans without much money dependent on the goodwill of family and friends for their bed and board. And this was a very precarious position, especially for a young girl in the society of the time. And then the Callaghans came into Catherine Macaulay's life. Catherine accepted the invitation of the Callaghans, who were friends of her relative William Armstrong, to live with them as a companion to Catherine Callaghan in their home in Mary Street in 1803. Later the same year, she moved with them out to Kulak House, which was on the outskirts of the north side of Dublin, not very far from Storminston, where she had been born herself. William Callaghan was a prominent pharmacist in Dublin at the time. He was a Protestant and his wife was a Quaker. They were a childless couple who had spent a number of years in India. And when Catherine went with them to be a companion to Catherine Callaghan, Kulak offered her the security of a comfortable home. Added to this, and maybe more importantly, the Callaghans loved Catherine Macaulay from the start. For them, she was the daughter that they never had. And for a long time after she moved in, something she treasured was missing. She found something missing in her life. And this could not be found at the Callaghan's table, elegant as it was, or at their frequent parties, pleasant as they were. And once again, Catherine, Catherine's unease came from the fact that she could not express her Catholic faith openly. Despite this, 
Catherine, in turn, grew deeply fond of her adoptive parents. She spent hours with Catherine Callaghan reading to her. She nursed her constantly and until her death in 1819. And she was instrumental in enabling Catherine Callaghan to become a Catholic, which was a source of great joy to Catherine Macaulay, but also a source of great tension, as at the time it happened, she did not know how William Callaghan would take it and what his reaction might be and how that might affect their relationship. However, after Catherine's, Catherine Callaghan's death, William Callaghan lived on for another three years. Once again, Catherine devoted herself to his care and again was as devastated by his death as she had been by his wife Catherine's. He was not in the least bit outraged by his wife's conversion to Catholicism as Catherine had feared. In fact, towards the end of his life, he began to move in that direction himself, but died before it came about. Before William Callaghan died, he protected Catherine's future and secured it for her because he was galvanized into action after overhearing other relatives of his discuss what they would do to Catherine once they had control of his house and estate. The fact that William Callaghan left her the sole residual legatee of his entire estate came as a great surprise to Catherine. She never expected it. It was not something that she had at any time expected. She had to endure the contesting of the will by William's relatives, but their challenge came to nothing. Catherine finally became William Callaghan's rightful and legally recognised heir in 1823, 1824. Whatever happened in Catherine's heart during the years she spent with the Callaghans, and she spent over 20 years with them, Three things can be identified. The graciousness, courtesy and hospitality that characterise the whole of our life were fully developed during these years. Catherine eventually sought guidance in relation In time, even during their lifetime, she plucked up the courage to do this, uh, she found that the Callahans, when she sought guidance for her faith and plucked up the courage to do it, she found that the Callahans, while preferring not to have religious symbols of the Catholic faith prominent in their home, were not hostile to Catherine practicing her faith openly and were very helpful to her when she wanted to help children on the estate with religious instruction and with material help. And Catherine's own interior life of prayer deepened and was tested during this time in Kulak while she lived with the Callahans. Her relationship with Jesus, poor and abandoned, was strengthened. She found great consolation in her relationship with the poor, abandoned Jesus, as she called him. There was also a reciprocal influencing between the two Catherines in the area of faith. If Catherine Callaghan became a Catholic at the end of her life, Catherine Macaulay, for her part, was deeply influenced by the Quaker attitude to quiet in prayer, to reading scripture, something which was a great help to her in later life, but which was very unusual for an Irish Catholic at the time. In the Callaghan home and in their company, Catherine grew into mature womanhood. It was during this time that her personality began to blossom and mature. She was obviously loving, responsible and sensible since the elderly couple grew fonder of her as they consistently entrusted more and more of the running of their home and estate to her. She was kind, considerate and generous, not only to Willem and Catherine Callaghan, but also to the tenants and the workers on the estate, their families and their children. And she was well noted for that in her time. 
She was a young woman who was not only socially competent, she was also, but she also developed an acute sense of social awareness. She was very sensitive to those less fortunate than herself. And since she had known the precariousness of poverty herself, that sensitivity was honed and very acute. Her experience of the loss of people she loved, of home and status, her experience of dependency on the goodwill of others affected her deeply. She would give material help whenever and wherever she could, often from the Callaghan household with the blessing of William and Catherine, but frequently too from her own pin money, which they called it then, which she could have used for another purpose, like buying herself a new bonnet or something like that. In her giving, and this is a thing that again people noticed about her and spoke about it, she always turned a person's attention to God as the giver of all good rather than focusing on herself. So once she becomes the heiress to the Callaghan estate, a new horizon opens up for her and we find that life takes another twist. After William Callaghan's death, Catherine continued to live on in Kulak House and to teach in the poor school in Middle Abbey Street. At that time, she, she was taking care of a number of orphan children whom she, had, whom she knew from her cousin and from people that she knew. She was ever practical. She also opened an outlet for the children who worked, who, who were in the school in Middle Abbey Street. And she opened an outlet for the sale of plain and fancy needlework done by these pupils under her, her tuition. She always had the, um, the idea before her that the best thing to do was to help people to help themselves. With the Callan fortune at her disposal, she approached her mentors and friends, a Dr. Edward Armstrong, a priest in the Dublin Diocese, Dr. Michael Blake from the Dromore Diocese, with her threefold plan for looking for using her inheritance. And the three things were this. She wanted to provide a solid religious education for young girls, hundreds of whom were roaming the Dublin streets at the time. She wanted to provide protection or temporary shelter and training for young women who thronged the city streets at the time looking for work. She wanted to assist dying poor, both physically and spiritually, in their homes and in, their, in the hospitals. And while I won't go into it, like if you know anything of the history of Dublin at the time, there was a huge dichotomy. There was a wealthy side, a wealthy side to the city, but there was also an extremely poor side, one of the poorest in Europe at the time. So the, this threefold plan had matured in Catherine over the years. So she began to realize that this is what was needed. And when the time came to put it into practice, she was clear about what she wanted to do. She consulted another good friend, Dr. Murray, the then Archbishop of Dublin, and she leased a site on the then fashionable Bagot Street in Dublin too, which at that time was the centre of the city. In 1824, Dr. Michael Blake laid the foundation stone before he headed over to Rome to reopen the Irish College there at that time. Building a house for the purpose for which Catherine Macaulay intended it at the historical time in Ireland was a daring and courageous act. All the more remarkable since it was done by a single woman who was also a Catholic. In the house under construction, Catherine had schoolrooms, dormitories for young women, simple apartments for herself and the volunteers, and a small oratory. She poured every penny of her inheritance into the project. And indeed, her brother was known to have called the project Kitty's Folly. He didn't really know what it was for, but he thought she was out of her mind. 
On September 24th, 1827, which happened, though they didn't plan it that way, happened to be the feast of Our Lady of Mercy, the house on Bagot Street was formally opened to the poor, those who needed education and those who needed shelter. And the women who opened it decided just to call it the House of Mercy because it happened to fall on the feast of Our Lady of Ransom or Our Lady of Mercy. In that time in Dublin, the majority of the people were hungry for food, education and justice. And among Catherine's first helpers on that day in September 1827 were Catherine Byrne, her own cousin, and Anna Marie Doyle, a young Dublin woman who is also an ancestor of Arthur Conan Doyle. And they actually, Catherine Byrne and Anna Marie Doyle, actually administered the house because Catherine wasn't free to join the group since this time she was nursing her sister Mary, who died shortly afterwards from tuberculosis. tuberculosis. And it just so shows something of Catherine's capacity to choose the colleagues who were working with her to allow them to start the venture, which she had poured all her inheritance into, but they were the people she trusted. She had a, an innate capacity to trust people. And Catherine was at least twice the age of Catherine Byrne and Mary Ann Doyle, but she trusted them. Catherine always imagined that her project would be an enterprise that was conceived and run by a group of lay women volunteers who would do the very best they could within their circumstances for those who are less fortunate than themselves. That was her original dream. She was very single minded in terms of using every resource she had at her disposal for the poor. Her own wants and those of her young helpers were very modest. They had a very simple life in common. They wore very simple clothes and actually attracted attention by their utter simplicity to the extent that voices began to murmur in the city that another Catholic community of religion, religious women was being brought into being surreptitiously in the Dublin diocese. The Archbishop of Dublin, Dr. Murray, who had confirmed Catherine as an adult and also was also a very close friend and mentor of hers, was forced to tell her that she would have to regularize her undertaking canonically meaning in simple words that she'd have to publicly establish a congregation of women religious under his patronage or else the whole enterprise would have to be given over to an already established congregation which had the same vision and orientation as Catherine. And you can imagine what that must have meant to her, given, as I say, that she put everything she had into it, but her dream had been to continue as a lay woman and volunteering. For Catherine, this turn of events was most unexpected. She was now 50 years of age. She could be forgiven for thinking that she had given her all. She had invested every penny she had in the building on Bagot Street. She spent the greater part of her life nursing sick relatives and friends, taking responsibility for the next generation in her family, teaching and caring for the poor whom she knew and now she was being asked to found a congregation of women religious and she knew nothing about religious women's congregations. Eventually, she said she agreed that she would found the congregation because other congregations didn't allow the sisters to go out to the people in their homes. And that was the thing she wanted. Not alone did she expect the poor to come to where she was. She felt that it was important that she go to where the poor were. So the immediate and most demanding aspect of this new turn of events was that Catherine and two others, Anna Maria Doyle and an Elizabeth Hartnett set out to do their novitiate in the Presentation Sisters, which was located in George's Hill in Dublin's north inner city, not very far away from Bagot Street, nor indeed from Mary Street, where Catherine was known as a familiar figure as she taught in the school and visited the sick poor in their homes. 
When Catherine and Anna Maria and Elizabeth made profession of their vows about a year and a half later, on the 12th of December 1831, a new congregation was born, the Congregation of Mercy. After founding the congregation, Catherine lived for 10 years. In that time, she negotiated a cholera e epidemic in Dublin by working with her sisters in shifts from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. in a cholera hospital set up in Townsend Street from March to December 1832. It was the first big challenge that they had as a congregation. She founded then about 10 convents around the country in Ireland and in also two in England. She also had difficulties with local clergy, people like the local clergy were, were had a, she had a lot of difficulties, especially with the uh, parish priest of Westland Row. Also during this 10 years, she saw her young nieces and nephews predecease her, together with a number of the younger women who had joined her in her, joined her in her work because TB, tuberculosis, was rampant in Ireland at the time. During that time, she sold the house she had inherited in Kulak in order to continue to fund the work started in Bagot Street. The founding of a congregation cost a lot more even than the, the amount of money that she had inherited. But nothing daunted, she continued to care for the poor through education, caring for the sick in their homes, providing shelter for the young people, for the young women who came to work in big houses in the city at the time. They needed, often needed a safe place to stay, to move away from their workplace at night time. She herself died of tuberculosis, tuberculosis on the 11th of November 1841, which is what, nearly 180 years ago. So in the second part of my talk, I'd just like to focus on just one aspect of Catherine's very varied life, and that is on education, because she was an educator with a vision. Through her lived experience, Catherine learned that merciful love means cordial tenderness and sensitivity. She was impelled to the power of the Holy Spirit at work through the circumstances of her life to proclaim the mystery of mercy which she strove practically to make, and she strove practically to make the world around her more human. For Catherine, education was essentially a mission of mercy. She was passionately dedicated to educating youth, especially those who were poor and struggling. Catherine's vision of mercy at work in education was aimed at overcoming the gap of distance between those who were rich and those who were poor thus restoring human dignity through transforming social relationships. She didn't stop there, however. Equally, she sought to inspire those she taught with a real and personal love for Jesus, living and active in their lives. From her own close union with the source of all life sprang her graciousness, her exquisite courtesy, her respect for each one she met, especially those who were poor. And one thing that was known about her, she managed to convey a, a sense of specialness to each single person she met and taught. And this was something which fascinated people and drew them to her. We read a lot about that in any of the stories we have about Catherine that were passed down to us from people who lived with her. People sensed that she lived what she taught. Uh, education was an area on which Catherine concentrated much attention and effort during her adult life, first as a teacher and later as an administrator and pioneer in the field. She started her work as a teacher early in life with the children on the Callaghan State estate and with the poor school in Mary Street while she lived with the Callaghans in Kulak. All through her life, she sought to aid the recovery of human dignity through education. Though forms and methodology may change, this basic aim is valid and continues into our own time. 
A fact also maybe that's not that well known about Catherine is that during her 10 years as a foundress of a religious congregation, she opened more pension schools than she did houses of mercy, which in itself reflects her belief in the value of sound education and her capacity to respond practically to the needs of the time. Catherine's aim was to educate and elevate. Her success as an educator lay in her love for people and especially the poor, and the love of God that filled her heart and out of which she worked consistently. She opened her heart to God and she opened her hands to the people around her. Frances Ward, in a letter to Mary Gonzago O'Brien in 1879, said of Catherine, her good friend and colleague and sister in religion, Frances Ward and Catherine were best friends. And Frances Ward said this, you never knew her, I knew her better than I've known anybody in my life. She was a woman of God and God made her a woman of vision. She showed what it meant to be a sister of mercy, to see the world and its people in terms of God's love, to love everyone who needs love, to care for everyone who needs care. Now her vision is driving me on. And when Catherine was a teacher herself and later when she trained teachers, she sought to inspire those she taught with a deep and personal love for Jesus, living and active in their lives. From her own close relationship with Jesus came her graciousness, as I've said, her courtesy, her deep respect for every person she met. Formation as well as information was the key educational concept for Catherine. She was open to new ideas and ever ready to assimilate and adapt. And we find this in her application for incorporation of her school in Bagot Street into the national school system as soon as it was established in Ireland in November 14, 1839. The Bagot Street School was approved by the National School um, Board. Incorporation into the national school system meant that rigorous inspections would be the order of the day, but Catherine didn't fear this. In fact, given her own high professional standards for her monitoresses, teachers and sisters, she actually welcomed it. She also felt that children would improve if they expected examination. Many of the bishops of the time were against joining the system because they felt it would militate against the Catholic education of the children, but Catherine remained firm in her support. I mentioned earlier the pension school. Catherine initiated the pension school system starting in Carlow shortly, shortly after the foundation of the first convent there. This school was intended for the daughters of middle class parents for whom the fees of residential boarding schools were prohibitive, but who also wished further education for their daughters. A small fee or pension, that's where the word comes from, a small fee was charged for these day schools although this was waived if it was seen necessary. These schools were the forerunners of the secondary schools, colleges, high schools and academies that flourished around the world, especially in the English speaking world, in the years following the establishment of the first one in Carlow and as the Mercy Order began to spread abroad following the Irish emigrants as they moved to America, to Australia and further afield. Catherine saw an important social education and spiritual apostolate in these schools as the better off could be trained in their responsibility to the more disadvantaged. And further time, pension schools had a wide curriculum. They had Latin, French, Irish, English, history, geography, maths, bookkeeping, basic science, music, art, elocution and PE. Before the establishment of the vocational school system in Ireland, Catherine, because of her close association with the poor, her keen awareness for their need to be trained to earn money for themselves, had also established technical training schools where girls learned dressmaking, shirt making, lace making, embroidery, laundry skills and cookery skills. Together with these skills, Catherine also insisted that her pupils were trained to be trustworthy, responsible in positions they would assume and capable managers of the businesses that in the future would be theirs. 
Her willingness to learn from others, to share with others in the field, is another reason why Catherine was such a successful pioneer in education. We've often heard about her foresight in going to France to see the French system of education in practice before she opened her first school in Bagot Street. She was proficient in French herself. As an administrator, she devoted much of her attention to her associates, knowing that they in turn, if they were well trained, would carry through her vision to their pupils. She encouraged her associates many of whom were gifted and highly competent to continue their studies in languages, music, maths and art, and she tried to place them in classes suited to their tastes. She encouraged preparation for classes, was always open to new ideas. She was an experienced teacher herself, but as the congregation grew, she had to withdraw from full-time teaching in the classroom. And this forced withdrawal and the development, the, the increasing numbers of children who attended her schools, led her to adapt the Lancasterian or monitorial system. This meant that in each class there was a presiding trained teacher or sister in charge. And this person was assisted by another sister or teacher and a number of pupil teachers or monitoresses. In introducing the pupil teacher system, Catherine was ahead of her time. In Bagot Street, she introduced courses for promising pupils. Catherine had initiated the practice at least two years earlier. And as I've said before, formation as well as information here as elsewhere was pivotal for Catherine. As an administrator, Catherine was exigent about record keeping, registering Holy Communion and confirmations, and she stimulated healthy competition by re rewards and encouragement. She, she codified nothing, however. She didn't write down um, any, anything she, she didn't codify anything, holding the firm belief that professionally well-trained sisters and teachers would make changes and improvements as needed. She cooperated with other congregations, for example, in setting up a pension school in Limerick, she worked with the Poor Clare Sisters. And in Cork, she didn't open a national school or primary school because the Presentation Sisters were established there already. She brought her English sisters to visit the schools run by the Presentation and Poor Clare Sisters in Cork, Dublin and Newry. And the point I think I really want to make here is that Catherine Macaulay trusted those that she worked with, those whom she taught, those whom she trained. And she felt that if they were well trained, well taught, then they were the people best place to carry the, the ethos to carry the principles forward themselves. In this area of education, as well as in many other areas of her broad apostolate of mercy, Catherine was very practical and very aware um, and very aware. And she was utterly single minded in doing what she saw needed and could be done for the poor of her native Dublin and elsewhere, because she shared the houses she founded were um, right around the country like Carlow, Tullamore, Limerick, Galway, etc. Her experience of poverty in her own life, her long time connection with the poor, both in Coolock and Middle Abbey Street and later in Bagot Street, all served to enable her to know how to be with and for the poor in a way that left them and herself mutually ennobled, enriched and enabled. Few others had the courage to do what Catherine did in her time. She was instrumental in building up a comprehensive system of Catholic education in Ireland. And she did this while working side by side with the state system of national primary school education, the pension schools at secondary level and training schools at tertiary level. We also have to see this work in light of attitudes to Catholics in Ireland at the time because the, when Catherine started, the penal laws were only very gradually being, being repealed 
but she was friendly with Daniel O'Connell. He had a house in Pembroke Street, not far from Bagot Street, and he was a frequent visitor to the schools in Bagot Street. And for the poor children at Christmas, he'd come and carve the turkey for them. Through education, she fostered human dignity, human progress. Her creed of service was the poor need help today, not next week. She kept her hand firmly in the hand of God. And one maxim she was fond of repeating to those who would be teachers of the young was, let us sometimes speak to their holy angels and ask through their intercession for all graces for our pupils as well as for ourselves. All that she accomplished in the field of education is but one ray from the prism of light, which is the life of this great woman. Like the apostles with the five loaves and the two fish, she did what she could with what she had at her disposal. And like the apostles with Jesus, God blessed her work with an increase that went far beyond anything she could have ever imagined or dreamed. And in conclusion, Heidegger tells us that our future comes to meet us out of our past. In this modern, postmodern technological age where communication, but also alienation and aggression are issues of the time, a study of the life and spirituality of Catherine Macaulay is as relevant as it was to another generation. She leads the way in pointing out how any of us, any ordinary person, can be a conduit of God's mercy and loving kindness in the ordinary round of everyday life. She understood and lived the conviction that Christ has no body now but ours, and that each one of us brings his or her own unique gift to living that communion in the time and place in which we find ourselves. Her own lived witness to love, love of God and love of other people, was the companion volume to the scriptures in the study of which she herself found the secret of life and love. And her sushi pay prayer, a self-offering of herself to God, sums up the interior attitude of this grace, gracious, intrepid and very human woman. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, Sister, Sister Brenda. Brenda. That was, that was so, so, so Thank you. Thank you. you, 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 you certainly, certainly get one.